this is a layered approach question. If you're asking which lock should I use to make myself secure, that's grammatically a correct sentence, but it is not a correct assumption in what the answer is going to be, if that makes sense. You're putting your focus in the wrong... Uh, you're putting your focus in only one area when the answer should cover many areas. There we go. Fish that one out. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. I'm excited. We are live, and this is another lockpicking episode. This should be episode number 233. This is how to choose between using a keyed lock or a combo lock. So some housekeeping up front. We usually don't do housekeeping, uh, and now that we're doing it, we're going to try and keep it short for you. So I'm going to talk fast. Uh, We're not completely abandoning all of our other important and interesting and unique and valuable tactical content. So we're still going to talk tactics, uh, but we will be focusing most of our time on lock picking and covert entry. And we're also going to spend a lot of time on concept learning and systemized approaches and developing your learning and teaching skills in the future. So we're going to have, uh, we're still going to have some new experts come in and talk about tactical things like shooting gear. We had, uh, Blake, Blake water. 0326, I think is, are the numbers attached. He talked about gear recently. We have people on to talk about shooting, fighting, all those things. Um, but we have some changes coming up with our direction. Uh, we may we may change again in another few months. Who knows? Uh, but this is where we're heading now. So uh, we're also going to add in some dog content. I do have a dog podcast. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I have a, a dog training business. And it is just so completely, it's so powerful. And it just adds so much value to your life when you do dogs the right way. So we will be exploring that in the future. Uh, some more standardized housekeeping. This is stuff you should know if you listen to any of our other episodes. Ready, go. Feel free to drop me an email at any time. My email for this podcast is pat at utac.io. That's also the shortcut for the website, utac.io. Uh, that's a great place for feedback for this podcast. Uh, or you can shoot me a DM on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active. Uh, for the dog stuff on Instagram, it is at K, the letter K, the number nine, philosophy, K9 philosophy. Uh, thank you so much to all of the Patreon. It is really a big deal. Uh, it helps us keep the lights on, literally. This is a free podcast to listen to, um, and we hope you find some value in it, but it is quite expensive to produce behind the scenes, as well as all the other projects that UTAC is involved in. So a f- couple patrons I really want to thank. So we have Jason R., thanks so much. We have Crisis12, that's a cool name. We have The Militant Hippie, thanks a million. We have Richard Griffith, cool name, and I've I've actually known several Richard Griffiths in the past. We have a Mel, uh, which is new to our online course, and we have Ethan C. So thank you a million. Uh, even at the $2 level for a tip, it is a huge deal. It just makes my day every day that I see that, and it helps us keep the show coming. Uh, anything above the $2 level on Patreon, Patreon gets you access to our after show, which tonight is going to be the weirdest conspiracy theories that we've heard. Uh, next, our UTAC group. That's at the top level of our Patreon subscribers. I think that's the $35 a month one. Uh, that is a a members-only Discord that we have. Right now, we have about somewhere between 20 and 30 people there. It's a small group, and it's, it's active 24-7. So anytime you want access to lockpicking stuff, dog stuff, a backlog of private training video courses that we've done, that's a good chance to uh, to get involved in that. So if you want access to me, and Dave is also unreachable for any comments, but Dave is available in our online tactical training group, which we call the UTAC group. So starting in this new year, January 1st, we're going to open up just a couple seats there. We like that it's small. Uh, our goal is not to expand that. Um, we really like that we know every person on there and we're able to <laughs> readily remember usernames. Um, and that is a place that we do talk tactics a couple times a month where we do have experts come in and teach tactics to the group. So I know we're going a little bit long on housekeeping, but this is some important stuff. Next, uh, if you want a high quality family protection dog like Arrow here, who is keeping my feet warm below my desk, email me pat at utac.io. And we can get on the phone and we can see if Fortress Canine Protection Dogs are right for you because they're not right for everybody. So you should know what you're getting out of a dog. 
Uh, and if they are right for you, we'll get you a discount on a Fortress Canine Dog. And disclosure, uh, that is a affiliate program. So you get a discount, but I also get a return on that. So I am biased 100%. But I also own one of their dogs and love it and wouldn't change it any other way. Uh, anything else you need, you should be able to find at uncensoredtactical.com. Sorry that the housekeeping went a little bit long today, but it was some important stuff. Uh, we don't always do intro housekeeping. Uh, we'll be moving it to the end uh, soon, but for the next few episodes, there's going to be a little bit of it because we have a big year coming and some big changes, and we want to keep you guys up to date. On to content. Sorry. Dave, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Overview. So for your home, your business, or part of your home, or part of your business, um, or for a door somewhere, or a padlock, or a gate, or a garage, people often often ask, should I use a padlock or a door with a key, or a padlock or a door or a mechanism with a passcode? And there's also physical and digital coded locks to consider as well. So we are going to help you hash this out to hopefully get you an answer to that question. And of course, we're going to rabbit trail a little bit, and we're going to go deep and... Here we go. First segment. Keyed locks. We're going to try and focus just on keyed locks here, but we might do a little comparison. So it's a good and bad thing about keyed locks, in theory. In theory, is that the only people that have access to that locked obstacle are the people with the key to that obstacle. It's good. Um, for access control, just the tip of the iceberg, standard thinking. We're not even discussing picking or bypassing or destructive entry yet. For standard access to a space, the only people that go in are the people with the key. So keeping honest people honest, it is access control uh, that's much more controlled than a four-digit code. So that that's some, in some ways, that's a pro. In the same exact ways, that's also a little bit of a con. Meaning, if you want to share access with someone... You have to physically get them a key. So that could be uh, one of the biggest downfalls is sharing access. Uh, that's one of the biggest parts that we're going to come back to on this episode a lot is uh, sharing access and access controls. Uh, Dave, feel free to jump in with keyed lock pros and cons. Yeah, I think a big pro is I think your upper end of scalability with security. And maybe I'm wrong on this. We can discuss this more. But I think you have a higher ceiling with keyed locks than you do most combination locks. Explain I'm sure what you there's mean some. That. Sure. So with a keyed lock, you can get a disc detainer lock. You can get a seven pin lock. You can get a massive shrouded lock with a huge body. Um, you can get crazy cores that have pins that come from the top and the side. With combination locks, unless you're doing something crazy electronic. I would say it is harder to go up that scale of security to the point where someone can't just guess or brute or brute force it. You can't accidentally guess some lock with an insane um, cylinder. You just can't accidentally guess that. You could, in theory, always accidentally guess a combo lock, and it gets a little more interesting with with electronic measures which we'll talk about in that section so i'd say that's mm -hmm. the caveat but i'd say for the regular person going for regular locks that you can just regularly find and throw on something that you want to protect i think it's much easier to scale the security level on average up with a key lock what do you think about that uh, i agree i was a little confused at first when you said the upward scalability um yes you're right i would agree with a lock itself that is more secure to being opened by the wrong people, I think, yes, the keyed variants can go to the moon with how different and unique and high security they are. Yes. Um, scalability for sharing access, keyed locks are a bad option. So think about having um, 100 employees and having to make and manage access to 100 different keys for a lock. And then every time a new employee comes in, you have to get them a key. And every time an employee leaves, you have to take their key back. It's a lot to manage. Uh, if you only have a passcode for entry, all you have to do is send out an email or a group text and go, here's the passcode. And again, we're going to talk about that in the coded area again. But um, it's, 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 I like this a lot because almost every part of this episode, each thing we discuss is a pro and a con. Like having this is a pro, but it's also a con because that. So that just that tickles me. I think that's so unique. Yeah. Um, and like 
tech stuff. I forget the exact um, wording of it, but basically, like you have to balance access and security. Not always, but a lot of times they're kind of at odds with yes. each other. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can scale the security of the lock up, but a lot of times you're scaling down the access, especially when you start having to get super specialty key blanks cut in super special ways versus, mm -hmm. like you said, just being able to share um, a password. Uh, so we'll get more, I think, into a later segment about the security measures specific to these and like lock picking considerations but as a general concept those are the main things i see with a keyed lock i guess i have another one too which is um every type of lock out there is susceptible to some type of weathering or you know just uh wearing down in time with usage um, but a keyed lock i would say a key is more likely to stop working because it's been worn over time or usage or the environment. Um, so it's more likely that the actual metal key gets rubbed and dented and bumped. And you're more likely to have a failure with putting the right key into a lock and it not working because of age or weathering. Whereas a combination lock, as long as you're putting the right combination in, you're much more likely for that combo to work over time. Um, and again, that's not something you really have to worry about. And for, it takes quite a while for a keyed lock and a key to stop working. But I think we all have seen someone's key ring where we go, what's this key go to? And they go, oh, it's this thing. I've had it for 10 years. That someday you're going to put the right key in and it's not going to work anymore just because it's been shaved down over time. Cool. And then I have another thing. I think that uh, key locks tend, and again, there are outliers on both both types of locks, but tend to scale better at. I think physical security, it is easier to find a plethora of beefy keyed locks that have protected shackles. So not that they don't exist with combination locks, but I feel like it's not hard at all to find a keyed lock that has more physical security beef to it than a combo lock. And again, there are exceptions on both sides. Sure, yeah. Both. Yeah, so I'm not, but I don't know. Do you find the same thing that on average, yeah, physical I, I security agree. tends to be a little bit more? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. All right, let's move into combo locks, and we're we're gonna go back and forth quite a bit in this episode, but we're gonna try to focus this next segment on combo lock pros and cons. So jumping right in, uh, you will never get locked out of a combo lock for not having your keys, which is nice be, uh, for a couple reasons. So let's say you're something like. Uh, it's the things in life that you don't expect. Like you take a trip or you're on vacation or you vacation. Vacation is a great way to lose your house keys and your car keys, uh, especially with packing them in the wrong bags or because you don't use your house key and car key on your vacation. Usually uh, when you get home, it's, you're usually like, you have to jog your memory and be like, Oh my God, where's the keys? I haven't used them in, all week. Or if you go to the beach or if someone picks you up for an event and they drop you off back at home later, um, you never have to worry about what you're carrying or what you're wearing or what time it is. If there's a combo lock, all you have to do is remember the combo. Uh, so for things you use frequently, you should not be forgetting that combo. Huge pro for combo locks. You can never get locked out if you like, if you go somewhere and you get wet and you change clothes and you just forget wh your wallet and your old clothes, you're, you're still covered. You have the combo. That's a big pro. All right. What do you got? Let's see. So I think I think I kind of rolled a lot of my thoughts with it. So yeah, um, can't ever get locked out. I think yeah, they're easier and faster. Just less logistics to have to worry about. You can oftentimes change the combination on the fly much more easily than having to go. Well, yes. so some pad so some Usually, padlocks. Yes. Yeah, so some padlocks you can't remove the core period, so you're kind of stuck with that key. Uh, whereas combo locks on a lot of them, not all, you can change the combination. So not only is it easier to share access, it's also easier to revoke access. Um, again, that has its limits, which we'll cover in a later section. But yeah, I see that as another as another pro too, is you can, if you know you have someone coming over who just needs temporary access, you can just change it to something for them and then change it back and they don't have the code to your shed or whatever. Cool. Uh, I have a big 
So a con for combination locks that you and I already discussed, but it's, it should have its own place here, which is if you're using a lock with a four digit or even six digit pin, like a combo, whether it's a physical lock, that's a mechanical push button, or whether it's a digital code that you punch into a keypad, um, people can just fucking guess your combo and get lucky. Cool. Um, so there's pros and cons within that as well. So for a mechanical system, like something like the realtor locks that hang on doorknobs, they're just a little box with the little plastic buttons on it. And it, there's no electronics in it whatsoever. It's a, it's a machine system that you punch the right numbers in and a locking mechanism is able to be open. So for those, as far as I know, and please, if you know of an exception, please email me. I'd love to know. But as far as I know, for a mechanical push button combination lock, and for most other mechanical combination locks, whether it's a spinny wheel or a push button, mechanical combo locks don't have a lockout function, meaning you can try as many attempts as you want, as fast as you want, and you can just keep going and there's no mechanism that will stop you from making more attempts other than like a person coming and saying, hey, what are you doing? Would you agree? Yeah, I would say I'm not familiar with just like a mechanical combination lock that has a lockout feature. And again, right. I could be wrong too, but yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not either. Cool. So that's a huge con for combo locks. Um, shameless plug here. We have developed a really freaking cool field usage tool for combination locks. So for combination locks where you push the buttons in, where it looks like a keypad and you're pushing the buttons, uh, there's three different main styles of locks like that. And we have developed a field notebook for that. We call the Brute Force Code Notebook. It's available on our web store. Just go to uncensoredtactical.com and click the store link on top or the side of your browser. Um, that will give you every possible code to the push button locks that fit certain mathematical rules. And some of those rules are explained within the book. Um, so if you're locked out, you will 100% get into a lock as long, I mean, barring strange exceptions, you 100% will get in based off of a brute force combination attack, meaning you try every single combo. And yes, there's exceptions and there's better ways to get more out of that book. Um, if you understand a little bit more about the conceptual approach, but it's a really cool tool. And honestly, I recently took my, um, my snap gun, my pick gun out of my second line gear bag and put one of those spirals in way more value for me to have that with me. Cool. Totally agreed. And I'm just going to throw in one last disclaimer for the lockout. I'm sure that someone somewhere has made a physical lockout lock, but if you go into Amazon as a common person, I don't think there are any common locks besides some like off the wall thing that someone has made. So anyways, beat that one to death. <laughs> cool. And yes, We're, we love that. <laughs> All right. Yes. Um, for electronic well, system. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just keep rolling. No, uh, yeah, go. All right. God, we're so, we're so smooth. So for elect electronic systems that have a code, there are tons of ways, which this is a big pro. There are tons of methods for which you can lock out someone trying to guess codes. Uh, one way to do that is a wait period. So if you've ever gone to someone's house or like their apartment complex and they have a big gate in the front and they have that big steel colored box with the green screen and the silver keypad and the people are like, hey, make sure you press 629 star and that'll let you in. If you press like 628 star on accident and you've ever had to wait for the screen to go incorrect code, thinking, welcome to apartment complex, scrolling, when ready, please enter. Like, there's a long process for not just a lock, not just a lockout for security, but you can only put the code in when the screen says enter code. And if you enter the wrong code, the machine has to think and it has to get you back to the enter code thing. So that's what we call a uh, oh God. What do you call that? I don't know what the scientific term would be, but that's a. It's just a timer attempt lockout. For every code you put in, it takes time to reset to put the next code in. Sometimes that can be short, medium, or even really long. Then you have um, specific security measures, like if someone, uh, not necessarily for apartment complexes, because traffic has to get in if someone keeps trying codes or not. Uh, so for something like a, a safe or your front door to your house, um, you have an option for a permanent or semi-permanent lockout. Phones have this a lot, right? If you try three codes wrong on someone's smartphone sometimes a little message will pop up pop up going 
Wrong code entered too many times. We're going to put you on a five minute wait. You can't try any codes until then. That's a, that's a specific security measure for a timed intentional lockout for wrong guesses. You can also do a permanent lockout. Some Again, phones are great with this. Try 10 of the wrong codes and we'll just wipe everything on the phone and we're done. Like delete. Uh, there's also lockouts that are active. Like if you do the wrong code, an alarm will go off. Or if you do the wrong code, our security company will be notified. This is common for uh, home security systems. So someone will respond if you put the wrong code in. So that's a big pro as far as security is concerned for choosing a coded digital lock. I have a con. Go for it. It is easier to shoot yourself in the foot with a combination lock uh, because a lot of humans will tend to pick lazy combinations. So if you yes. just pick your address or your phone number, whereas if you so you could buy a quality. So if we're talking to quality locks to buy a quality key lock and a quality combination lock, it doesn't matter how high quality the combination lock is. If you set an easily guessable combo. Whereas right. if you buy a high a high quality key lock, they've already done the work with the core and the bidding and everything for you. So if you buy a quality lock with a key lock, you're kind of more set in terms of not screwing yourself over. I mean, we've beat it to death too. I think we did most of an episode on it. Even posting a picture of your key with a key lock is probably again not depending on who you are and who's attacking you, probably is not in, oh my god, you're screwed. You know, because it has to be a certain pic, like a certain clarity of picture. So even that, you have some wiggle room, is it's not like, oh no, your key was kind of in a social media picture for, from a distance, you're screwed. You'd have to go out of your way pretty hard to screw yourself over, just in terms of someone defeating that actual lock through the keyway with a quality keyed lock. Um, versus a combo. I'd agree. Yeah, it's a seri- I think it's an overhyped threat. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's a real threat. It's just, yeah, overhyped. So for digital things, I think the likelihood of the lock itself malfunctioning is much higher. Um, and there are exceptions. So disclaimer, there's exceptions to almost everything we're going to talk about tonight. And we reserve the right to be wrong. And we reserve the right to not talk about crazy minutia in every single episode or every episode would be like 37 hours long. Yes, there are crazy encyclopedic in-depth issues for every topic we're going to cover tonight. So please don't beat us up. <laughs> but uh, for electronic systems, you have a problem, one, with power and two, with lines getting wet or getting crossed or being installed incorrectly or, you know, all sorts of back, you know, uh, backdoor access and shortcuts and um, just electronic locks are way more rife for a malfunction or an error or loss of power, you know, giving you some sort of issue than a mechanical keyed lock. Cool. Next segment. Yeah, let's do, uh, this is the biggest decision-making factor for which should I choose, key or combo? Uh, a couple of big things. Number one, sharing access. So how many people need access to this lock? Cool. Next is ease of access. Um, how easy is it to manage who is accessing this lock? So those are probably two of the biggest determining factors. The third, um, just because security extremes are way less common, um, is the nature of the space being secured. That's also important. So uh, let me give you an example of that before we move on. So the best example for that is someone using a three-digit combination, like where there's three separate wheels and each of them go from zero to nine. Um, One of those locking up a loaded handgun underneath your bed. Terrible idea. Number one, you have to use some fine motor skill to roll those wheels to the right digit. Uh, if you're off by just a little bit, like if it says nine 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 and a half instead of nine nine nine, uh, then it might not open. So you got to use those fine motor skills. Not great in a rush. Uh, the other problem is, if you have children in your home, and that safe is being used to keep your children out of your loaded handgun that's in a safe, that's a problem because even the dumbest kid can walk up to that safe and go, "All right, I'm going to start counting." 
Zero, zero, zero. Is that it? Nope, that's not it. Zero, zero, one. Is that it? Nope, that's not it. And they're probably going to get it quicker than 999. Uh, so that is a lock that is quickly and easily unlocked by the wrong people with even the mo- like a minimal of effort, just counting. Everyone knows how to count? Yes, you can get in this safe. So what you're securing is important. If it's a back shed to your house and you're like, oh, I have this tool shed and we really don't have a fence and we really can't put one in now or ever. And there's a lot of people that just walk around our neighborhood. So we want something so that people don't just meander into our back shed and steal our tools. Uh, So the threat is my neighbors walk around here a lot. I have an open backyard. I just don't want someone going, eh, I'll just pop into their shed without their permission. So not really even criminal, but just nosy neighbors. A three-digit combination lock is great for that. It's great. Because for one of your neighbors to go, oh, I'll just open that lock. That is a very clear boundary that that person doesn't have permission. They shouldn't be attempting to open that lock or that door. It's very clear. It's just, it's one small layer to go, you are wrong if you're opening this lock without the right combo. And they probably can open it, But it's a very clear signal to them, to you, to the police, to whoever, to go, that is wrong. Do not go in there. So it's great for keeping honest people honest. So the nature of the space that you're keeping people out of is important to consider, as well as sharing access and ease of access. Wow. Did I beat that one to death or not? Yep, it did. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've kind of covered a lot of that. So I don't know if I have anything super specific to add to this part. Um, yeah, what else do you got on this? Sure, I had a big one. Um, we probably mentioned it before. Um, I mentioned it a lot when people ask. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we put it in the book too. So let's talk about uh, sharing access. Probably the one of the biggest determining factors. For a physical combination lock all users have to have access to the only sole three or four digit code Um, that means that there is no record keeping there's no tracking right Uh, so anyone with the code can enter for an electronic lock uh, it gets complicated so if there's a keypad let's say you're let's say that it's a four digit code and you have a keypad zero through nine with a star and a hashtag and an enter Hashtag Jesus pound (laughs) Um, for an electronic keypad. If it's a four digit code that you're giving users, you can have 10,000 different unique codes that people put in from zero, 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 all the way up to nine, 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 nine. What that means is if you have a tracking system, which you can put on some, some systems, not all systems, um, you can give an individual digital four digit code to every specific individual user. And what that does is it tracks which code was put into the lock and when. So what that means is if you only have two employees and they each have a separate code and the boss leaves for the day and the employees allegedly leave for the day and someone goes in at nighttime and they put in their specific individual code into the keypad, There are systems that can digitally track that on some type of computer. So the boss comes in in the morning and goes, oh my God, it's a mess in here. What happened? There are some systems where you can go, oh, let me pull up who had access here. Oh, look, user number two, which used the passcode 2468, they accessed the building last night. Unless you have some other layered security system, all you have is a code and a timestamp. So with cameras added onto that, you have a code, a timestamp, and a video of a person. Uh, With a keyed access as well, you have a list of, you know, tracking who has access to a key, and you have their digital code input, and you have a camera. So really, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but a layered approach is better. But if nothing else, it's nice to track individual people with individual codes if anything goes wrong. Another problem, the con to that same exact benefit is... If you have more individual codes input into the system that will open the system, for every other code that you put in, every additional code you put in that will work as an access code, you make it easier for someone to guess a code. So think about this. If I only have one code, right? If it's a, if it's a one-digit lock, and I'm like, all right, 
I have three employees. You, if you put in the number one, the lock will open. You, if you put in the number two, the lock will open. You, if you put in the number three, the lock will open. So someone guessing has a three in 10 chance of guessing the right combo with one with one entry attempt. And they could try, if they try 10 entry attempt, or let's see, if they try eight entry attempts, one of them will be correct. In theory, roughly. If I have nine employees and 10 access codes for this single digit lock, right? So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those are all individual access codes. If I have nine employees and a criminal wants to guess and he just goes, uh, let's try, you can just close his eyes and go this button. He has a 90% chance of getting in. Okay, let's, let's expand that out, right? So 10,000 combinations for a four digit electronic lock. If it's a four digit employee passcode. If you have a hundred employees, and there's let's say a thousand employees, and there's ten thousand combinations, that's a one in ten chance for a criminal guessing the right code. So basically, if he guesses ten times, he's bound to land on one of the right codes. Uh, so the more employees you have with specific user codes, the more likely it is to easily guess. Hopefully, that makes sense. I think I circled that two or three times. Man, we're good at that. Yeah, and I think, too, if you're following a brute force uh, from our notebook, if you want to brute force every possible code, it doesn't mean it's going to take you the full time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our time estimates are if you had to try everything to get it. Also, if someone is systematically brute forcing, if you're putting more codes in, there is now it, yeah, a just, lot yeah, more check. Yeah, just a, a lot more checkpoints to hit from a systematic brute forcing too, which again, if you only had one code, that could fall early on too. I mean, so I think that statistically it still is similar, but thinking about using our like code notebooks and stuff, I would love to have multiple stop points in that versus hoping I find the one stop point that opens the lock. Um, I did think of another con of... yeah combination locks especially talking about the digital and kind of push button ones on buildings mm -hmm. so a keyed lock probably won't leave visible evidence of what the bidding is on the lock itself however when people are pressing keypads and combination locks oh yeah it will start to wear down and you'll see three of the you know buttons are very shiny the others are also painted black uh so if you're going to be managing a large num number of people in and out i mean a combination lock might be your only option because it might be just logistically too difficult to send out 200 new keys every single time you change it or mm -hmm. like someone gets hired or fired i mean so not saying this means you have to use a keyed lock but just something to keep in mind is yeah if you're if you have a business with hundreds of people using it you're probably going to start wearing down the common combos to just have to be visibly obvious so just something to keep in mind cool next okay. segment yep uh, i'm looking for a specific podcast episode we did um do you know what the title was when we talked about the uh threat assessment when we talked about like how big of a threat is it actually if your key gets posted on social media yeah, like defining, like, uh, defining the threat. Um, uh, I'll look for just a second, and then I'll keep talking while you look, just so we don't have a ton of dead air. But I'll, give me just one. If you second. if you look, I'll talk because I wanted to add a sec a segment in too. All right, cool. Okay, yeah, you talk. I'll look. Deal. Uh, lock picking and bypassing as far as a keyed lock or a combo lock. This is important. Um, a layered, this is a layered approach question. If you're asking which lock should I use to make myself secure, that's grammatically a correct sentence, but it is not a correct assumption in what the answer is going to be, if that makes sense. Um, you're putting your focus in the wrong uh, you're putting your focus in only one area when the answer should cover many areas. There we go. Fish that one out. Uh, there are things to consider for ease of access. There's things to consider for access control. There's things to consider for the nature and the security of the space you're protecting. Yes. 
Um, and choosing your lock will help manage those things. A layered security approach will help make you secure. So there's two different things happening. You have managing access and making it easy to get access. And then you have making the thing secure. Those are two different concepts. They're like a Venn diagram. You have managing those things, then you have security, and then there's a little overlap in the middle. There's a moderate amount of overlap in the middle, but they can be two separate. So the question should be, how do I design an effective security system and also manage the right access and choose the right locks? Boom, brilliant, brilliant question that deserves a real answer. I get asked that quite a bit on Instagram. Which lock should I use? Well, it fucking depends. Uh, how much time do I have to get all the details from you? So uh, we told you earlier that we, w- we were just kind of making the tip of the iceberg with this discussion on helping you decide which lock is will better suit you and that we weren't discussing picking or bypassing. So now we're going to dig into people like some techniques and tools and practices for people that want to break or bypass that security. So now we're doing the lock picking stuff. Cool. So I did find the episode. So we talk about defending against more advanced attacks, such as pictures of people decoding pictures of keys in episode uh, it's titled Defending Against CMOE Attacks. And that is episode... Okay, I don't think it has a number on it that I can see in my podcast app, but Defending Against CMOE Attacks. Cool. That should came be out searchable. on June... Oh, I, I think episode 215 came out on June 5th of this year. Cool. 2022. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, so lockpicking. Oh, yeah, go Join on. us for lockpicking. Let's do it. Yeah. So I think, too, a big part of this is this will help inform your defense, too, of yes. knowing what at, what attacks there are. This will help you know what you're defending against. Uh, so in that episode we just named, Defending Against CMOE Attacks, it's all about your threat modeling. So for a lot of people, and again, everything is a trade-off. So are you just looking to prevent opportunistic meddling, wandering, maybe unsophisticated criminals. If so, there's a few high yield things. Um, People familiar with lock picking or us might be familiar with the concept of raking a lock, which if you're not familiar with it, the takeaway idea is it's considered a relatively unskilled attack. There are some locks you just stick a rake pick into it with a tension wrench. The raking is not super scientific most of the time and the lock pops open. It's a little more nuanced than that, but it's still considered an an overall more entry-level type of attack. It's not the super fancy, like, heist-level lockpicking of, you know, super specific pick profile. Um, So that's something that, in our courses, we get people opening real-life locks that you would get at Home Depot that you would commonly see everywhere. We get them opening those with raking attacks within the first 60 seconds to first five minutes. We get everyone a successful open on common real world locks. So if we want to both attack and defend against these, if we're defending against a casual attacker, we want to get something that you can't just rake open, that we couldn't just teach you within 60 seconds to a few minutes to get open with common tools. What that means is there are things called security pins that go inside the lock. And this is more of just a starting point for further research. Security pins make raking significantly more difficult. You can technically still rake locks with with security pins. It just gets a lot more difficult. Um, You can get your lock that has a different amount of pins on the keys. So you can have a lock core that only has four pins, five pins, six or seven pins. Usually... The more pins it has, the harder it is to lockpick to the point where oftentimes if you have something like a seven pin core, you have to have an attacker that's put a hundreds and hundreds of hours into practicing very specific fine motor skill lockpicking. Now the lock itself, like there are some locks that have a plastic body that have a seven pin core. So that's an important trade off too. just because seven pins doesn't mean it's a secure lock. But if we're just talking about you don't you don't want the keyway picked, 
You can look at security pins, the number of pins. Is the zig is the zigzag of the keyway really crazy looking? That can make picking more difficult. If you just Google the model of lock in the word bypass, see if anything comes up. A bypass, if you're not familiar, is where you don't even pick it. You don't you don't mess with the pins. You just reach around the pins, either with the tool or sometimes even just bashing the lock itself, and just cause the mechanism to di- to basically disengage, even though you didn't touch the pins or anything. Uh, so some locks have common bypasses. If you just Google the lock model and the word bypass, you can see if it does or not. Like I said, the physical strength of lock. Does it have a plastic shell but a 7-pin keyway? Then that's not overall secure. Does it have a tiny, thin little shackle that someone could break or cut through with a grinder pretty fast? That's not... You know, the keyway may be fantastic. Is that a secure lock for the types of threats you'll be facing? You can get a lock with a more obscure keyway mechanism, like a disk de- uh, detainer lock. Again, that gets to the point where someone has to have specialized tools and put in a decent amount of time practicing and researching. So now you are facing a specialist attacker at that point. Uh, so again, you might not need to defend against a, an entry specialist attacker. Um, yeah, and then if you want to defend against even more high security threats, you can get into the whole realm of what's called high security locks. And again, if, if you're not familiar, every lock in Home Depot is going to tell you it has the highest security rating. <laughs> Nine out uh, of ten. That, yeah, that's not what we mean by high security locks. We mean like padlocks that cost like 90 to $300. Um, On a scale by, of 1 think, to 7, this lock is a 6 in security rating. Exactly, and, yeah. And it can uh, be opened with a paperclip. Consumer Reports couldn't even pick it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, if you want to look at actual high security locks, there are like $300 padlocks you can get. I uh, like Asa Abloy, A B L O Y makes some. Uh Abus, A B U S makes some. Uh there are other brands, but at that point, if you're if you're facing that kind of attacker, you probably need to do a fair amount more research than what we would cover, you know, in just one segment of a podcast. Uh so Anything on key base locks and how lock picking is relevant to our topic that you had? Uh, I th- that was a really good coverage. That was a really thorough blanket you covered over that whole thing. I like it. Uh, I would emphasize that unique helps, different helps, uh, more helps. Uh, but we also, again, don't forget that it should still be a layered approach. So, yeah, I bought this obscure type of key lock mechanism that normal people that learn normal lock picking don't have the tools or the practice or the you know technique capability of picking it great that's a good start can someone shove a knife in your door jam and just rock that latch open yes or no oh crap yeah well it's a layered it's a whole system of approach you need in order to secure things with locked mechanisms yeah uh, perfect can- a lot of similar stuff with your combination locks, uh, but not as many options. Usually it's just, do you push the buttons for the combo mechanically, or do you push the buttons on a digital keypad? And if it's digital, how do you do your lockouts, and how long is the code? That's pretty much it. Um, the bypasses are similar but different. So for there are sometimes bypasses for these push button or for these uh, wheeled code combination locks. Sometimes you can just slide a tool through pull a lever and it pops right open faster than putting in the code Uh, other times you just can't fit your tool in and it's just miserable Um, other times it's possible but it takes a long time just to do to do the decoding Uh, most most low to low medium ish level combination locks most of them by a large percentage, can be decoded pretty easily and pretty quickly with decoding tools, meaning you just slide something in to feel what's happening inside the lock, and you just turn the wheel until you feel something unique, and then you use that information to move forward in your decoding. Um, Digital locks are unique because a lot of digital locks, um, physical, physical locks come with a code preset very frequently. 
and people don't change that code very frequently. So you can always just try what the code that comes from the manufacturer for physical push button locks or for wheeled combo locks. For digital locks, um, users are almost always putting in at least the first entry code and they don't often change that. Um, and there's lots of ways you can deconstruct that. So you can do what, we, what Dave talked about earlier, like social engineering, like picking a birthday and an establishment date or an address or a phone number, which is usually the four digit code. Um, but you also have things like a manufacturer reset that still might work on certain electronic systems. And you have backdoor methods like, uh, like admin codes or a master override code might be an option. And some of those things are public access information that come in the installation manuals or that you can just ask, you know, the company for, um, I worked at a, I did a little bit of time working with a multi-billion dollar facility and I was sitting next to one of the people that worked with the, um, with access, like the lock, locksmith people for the facility. And we were trying to change a combination for an electronic item that was in that facility. And so we called the manufacturer and I, I was sitting right next to the guy and he goes, Hey, um, I have a couple hundred of these locked systems in my building here. I need to change the, the passcodes for one of them. Can you help me with that? And the unnamed person on the other end of the line that worked at the manufacturer said, Oh yeah, you just uh, you just start with the uh, master override code. It's you know one two three four five six star 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 star, and that will just give you full access. And the person next to me, who remained unnamed to the manufacturer, was like, "Okay, thanks, bye." And we looked at each other. Like I was like, "Do you know them?" And he was like, "No." And I'm like, "Are you sure you weren't like on hold, like giving them your credentials?" He's like, "Nope." He's like, "They have no idea who I am." And I'm like, "Brilliant." So these things happen in real life. You can sometimes just call a company and go. Hey, can you give me the manufacturer override code? And they go, yeah. And you go, great, thanks, bye. And then you have access. So these things happen really unique with digital locks. Um, so you can put in your own code on a digital lock, and someone can also still use a manufacturer code or a uh, master code, they call them. How many times did I say that in loop? Three? Hello. Four? <laughs> Maybe. Sounds about common. right. Common listeners will not be surprised. Thank you for yeah. sticking with us. Yeah, through, but... Um, through the browbeating. Yeah, so again, this kind of gets into our threat assessment again. Uh, so kind of the flip side would be for key-based locks like key generation attacks. And that that's a lot of what we talked about, that defending CMOE attacks episode on. But, I mean, how many hours of practice in dollars do you think someone would have to spend to learn key generation even if the information was free off of YouTube, how many total hours do you think you'd have to practice to be able to carry out a real life key generation attack? Uh, middle of the road attack. I would say you need to spend at least uh, dedicated okay. hours. I would say six to 12 dedicated hours to of go practice. out into the field and make your way finally to a successful key. Not You're not going to be an expert at it, but six to seven hours of sitting there and filing and trying and filing and trying should prepare you for an attempt with some success possibility in the field. And then that's probably all on like a five pin lock or something too, with common blanks that you have access to. Yeah, um, lots, so kind of same lots thing. of variables. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah. So again, and that's not to poo poo people that might have these real threats. It's just to be realistic about what you're protecting against and be aware of what you're not protecting against and just know why you're making that trade-off. So again, if like I have like a tool shed, maybe I have some nice tools in there that I absolutely don't want to get stolen. But like you said, is my layered approach squared away? Are there no breakable windows? Are there no breakable doors? Is Are the latch, latches, you know, secured? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, did I not use some sort of handle that you can just reach under and grab, you know, with the tool? With, with Do you have good window. lighting? Yeah. Um, yeah, so again, for a tool shed, even with nice tools in it, it's doubtful that I'm going to get an advanced attack. However, if I am running a business or something and have a lot of valuable stuff inside, maybe you do have someone who does focus their practice skill set to harm you or again we covered this so so i won't dwell too long on it 
you might just be a regular person who has a serious situation with a stalker or something. So even if you don't have something valuable, you might still have a reason to prepare for a skilled or determined attacker. So again, none of this is to say that you're dumb if you prepare for a determined attacker. But we're just asking questions to get you thinking about what threats are you protecting against and why and what are you okay with leaving on the table that you're yeah. not protecting against. Yeah. Perfect. And there is no perfect security and there is no ultimate security. Even if you hired a million dollar company to come in and secure your home, like there's still things that they can't secure. Um, so security, like you said, as soon as we open the show, it is a balancing act between effectiveness and efficiency. It's a balancing act between how secure am I and how easy is it to access this space for the right people. So you could build a bunker around yourself and never leave. But even then, you know, there's certain missiles that can go through tens of dozens of feet of concrete before they explode. There, there is no perfect security. Uh, and that's a really, I think that's one of the biggest questions that people don't know exists in the security world. So like homeowners and security system installers and, you know, just asking the question, what do you want to defend against? Be specific. Oh, I have a stalker. Okay, great. So you should lock your door when you leave your house. You should lock your windows, you know, when they're not actively open and being supervised. Like you should... You know, you should get a video camera system up and running. You should have on-site storage for that video footage and off-site storage. Like, you should have at least one camera somewhere that's recording even if the power goes out. Like, you should have a panic button by your master bed. Like, if, like you, should, you should change your keys now and very seriously control the access to who has keys to your house. Like, all these things are good if you have a stalker. Yeah. If you and live in a neighborhood well. with criminals, like, if you're in a shitty neighborhood... You should worry about getting your door kicked in or a window smashed. And those are different security upgrades. Yeah, and I will say that a stalker is a good example of a scenario where if a picture of your key gets out on social media, maybe, yes, do rush to, to rechange your locks. Versus, while it's possible, if you accidentally upload a picture, then delete it of your key, as someone who doesn't have that specific threat, you might not need to freak out and change it as much. Even though, yes, it is possible someone could pull it down and carry out a sophisticated, determined attack. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, I think we've yelled at the audience enough today. <laughs> Open floor before we close out. Anything? Uh, no, I think that pretty well covered it. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I think this was good content. I think it's going to answer a lot of questions for people. I hope that people enjoyed this. Well, we have uh, some of the same housekeeping, a little bit different, but we're also going to move into the after show after this. So I'm going to try and move through this kind of quicker than the opening. We have a new book coming out soon. It's very expensive to get it published. Uh, if you're able to, there's lots of ways to support us. Uh, the free way to support us is like and subscribe on whatever platform you're on. Um, if you haven't done this yet, if nothing else, um, give us a thumbs up and maybe write a review on things like Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're on if you're able to. Uh, that's a really big help to us. Uh, sharing this content with anyone that you think will enjoy it is also a really big help and it's free and it's really quick. Uh, if you have the ability, we offer lots of things now, which we've really grown over the last few years. We sell lock picking tools and other gear. Um, we have three other published books that are available on our website. That's utac.io. That's the shortcut for our website. Just click on store. You can also scroll down the homepage of our website and click on the courses tab. We have some big courses coming up in 2023. You can also pick on you can also pick on and click on Tactical Lock Picking 101. That's our pre-recorded video series. It's almost as good as coming to an in-person course. Um, it's me on camera, a really nice high def, well lit uh, recording. It's like 8K that we you know brought down to about 4K resolution. Really good imagery, um, really good editing, and it's just a ton of info. So if you can't make it to an in-person course, that's a good option for you. Uh, we're not offering as many in-person courses next year as we did previously. Um, we also offer dog stuff. So if you want training or any other type of dog info, please get in touch with me. Pat at utac.io. That's my email address. So supporting us this fall would be a huge deal for us. Thanks a million. And, and feel free to shoot us an email and let us know what you think of the show. Uh, our closing tagline, which we almost never say anymore, ask hard questions, 
even about things you take for granted. Use smart tactics, even when you don't think you need them, and always bring your humor. We'd like to see all of you on the next episode, and we'll see some of you in the after show where we talk about conspiracy theories now.